Okay, uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start this uh, next session. My name is uh, Bill Powell. I'm the Asia editor and China bureau chief for Fortune magazine, uh, as well as a senior writer at uh, Time magazine. Let me introduce um, our panelists. As you saw from the previous session, uh, you know well a familiar figure, um, the Minister of uh, Commerce, Industry, and Textiles here in India, Minister Anand Sharma. The voice is a bit low. Sorry, I got to talk closer to the mic. Speak closer to the microphone here. Um, to Minister Sharma's immediate left is Mary Michael Nagu. She is the Minister of for State Investment and Empowerment from Tanzania. To her left is Balasu Brahmanian. Muturaman. He is the vice chairman of Tata Steel, and he is, perhaps more importantly uh, at this session, of course, the president of the Confederation of Indian Industries, the co-sponsor of this conference, and thus our host here in Mumbai uh, this week. At the far end, we have the Minister of Agriculture from Mozambique, Mr. Jose Pacheco. To his immediate right is Avril Gupta. Avril is the Michael Ding, holds the Michael Dingman Chair of Global Strategy and Entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland, and he is a widely published both author and columnist. And to my immediate left is Anoop Singh. Anoop is the Managing Director for Asia Pacific at the IMF from Washington. The IMF, I imagine, is a pretty busy place these days. The theme of our panel this afternoon is South-South trade. It is the extent to which the developing world, and in particular India and its trading partners in Africa, are able to decouple, as the expression the common expression has it, from the rest of the world, keep increasing trade and capital flows, even in the teeth of extraordinary global economic headwinds. We all know about the situation in Europe. Uh, we all know about the situation in the United States, which perhaps um, in slightly better shape than Europe at this point um, is also struggling to generate meaningful growth. Yet it's a critical fact to remember, and I think it sets the template for this discussion, that the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, this year will add roughly $2 trillion dollars in nominal GDP to the global economy. Two trillion dollars is the equivalent of one Italy. So at a moment when the Italian economy is teetering and journalists like me all over the world are focused intensely on the crisis in Europe, in the BRIC countries, Growth continues and indeed is adding the functional equivalent of the third largest economy in Europe this year. Minister Singh, uh, excuse me, Minister Sharma, my question is to you. And it's simple. Can this continue? Will it continue? It will. It's... Uh because of the priorities that our countries have identified, recognizing also the potential both of the industry as well as our people, and the imperative for our countries to maintain high growth rates, not for years but for decades, to ensure that the benefits of economic growth get redistributed and all sections of society benefit from it. 
we cannot create that possibility without ensuring that the economic growth is faster and if you do not have the resources the redistribution cannot take place it becomes a zero sum game that if you grow and do not give it back to the people to the society now when we look at the world in the backdrop that you have described yes there are concerns we cannot say that we are insulated i said in the previous session from what is happening in america what's happening in europe but that should not lead to a panic reaction also we have shown resilience in the past our economies rebounded quickly in 2008 9 crisis that is continuing in fact the recession as such is still very much there now when we also look at the larger picture globally there is a shift that is taken place the economic activity and the economic output more and more is coming from the developing countries and the emerging economies the brick countries which you refer to to which we belong we you know account for 48% of the global gdp and the developing countries as such it's 90% 85% of the world's population lives in uh, our countries so there, there is besides the opportunities and the potential uh, there's also richness of resources in some of our countries human resources which are integral to any country's growth any institutions forward movement now in the global context you see that the changes that are taking place asia africa latin america has shown dynamism and in two years from now what is projected that the economies of asia europe and the americas will be equal sized so we're talking of two years the rest of course it's a, how the growth momentum is sustained that will keep on changing the picture when it comes to the share in the global gdp which you refer to what it is today i have no doubt in my mind that it will grow many fold in the coming years Mr. Mutharaman, from the private sector's standpoint, what are the growth opportunities, particularly the theme of the, of the panel, South-South trade? What are the growth opportunities that, that you see as the Vice Chairman of Tata in, in the southern countries? We, all, we, we tend to focus on the, on the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, but there are in, an increasing number of success stories in Africa these days vibrant growth in many countries across the african continent are you seizing those opportunities you know there are i think two good reasons why the trade between emerging economies will grow even faster in the future than what it has grown in the past there are two good reasons for it the reason number 1 is If you look at the western world what has happened over time is apart from the current uh, financial crisis due to the high debt burden on many countries which is also of course the result of consumption based economy what has happened in western countries is they have been gradually becoming uncompetitive for many products of course commodities they are already uncompetitive for even the medium and uh, Uh, low technology products they are uncompetitive so except for some very high tech items large part of the western economy is uncompetitive and we must remember that irrespective of what laws you have what administrative mechanisms you have the fundamental competitiveness of a nation is what is going to determine how trade is going to flow and between who and who so the reason number one is the lack of competitiveness in 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 the in the western countries the second reason why i think the uh, trade between emerging economies will grow even faster 
is because you'll find that as the Western economies over time have become, become increasingly uncompetitive, what is happening in the, developed world, in the developing world is that the developing world for a long time have been just, uh, shall we say, uh, manufacturers using uh, low, low uh, you know, labor cost, low cost. Uh, arbitrage. So from being centers of manufacturing and centers of services purely based on labor arbitrage, over the last 10, 15 years, they have actually become centers of consumption also. They have become very powerful centers of consumption and they are large populated economies, quite a number of them including India and China. And while the costs in these countries are also going up, they are still very heavily competitive. So in terms of whether it is capable, and they are building capabilities over time. So you have, you have a mix of two things happening. You have on the one hand, the Western economies and competitiveness is going to force them. If you see the actual numbers, uh, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I'll give you some rough numbers. The trade between India and emerging economies, if you look at the exports, only 10 years ago in the year 2000, it was I think some 30 odd percent. Today it is in excess of 50% of the total exports of India. And if you look at imports, 10 years ago it was about 47, 48%, less than 50%. And today it is marginally higher than 60% in the total imports of India. At the same time, if you look at the same similar figures for the EU and the North America, actually there is a decline of about between 5 and 10% over the last 10 years. And I do believe that this is, this is going to go on because there is a need for the emerging economies. They are upgrading their skills, they are upgrading their technology, they are making manufactured products, they are becoming better in services and they continue to be com competitive in many of the products. And I, if you are to ask me whether it will uh, uh, make up for the loss of growth that may the Western, Western world will experience, I am not so sure whether it can make up in the short time. Perhaps for another 10, 12 years, it is perhaps not going to make up. And beyond that, I think it will make up. That's a fair point. Minister Nagu, I, I turn to you and ask simply, those are fascinating numbers um, that we just heard. Those statistics are, are even more impressive than, than I had realized. How do they evidence themselves in Tanzania? Do you see the evidence of, of uh, the economic shift um, that Mr. Muthurama was talking about in Tanzania, both in terms of exports, both real and potential to India, as well as um, imports from India. Uh, I will talk of Africa and then come to Tanzania. Okay. If we look at the statistics, one will tend to see that the share of Africa's trade in the, in the global trading is very small, hardly 3%. And that of Tanzania is hardly 0 0.03. So you will see that Africa is lagging behind. And it is lagging behind not because it is not trading, Africa is trading, but mainly in commodities, right. in their raw form. And countries do compete on productivity. And the productivity of Africa is low because of the low technology use and because of very little value addition. And products are, are exported raw. And on the other hand, we import goods of very high uh, uh, value and you find that kind of imbalance and that imbalance is not only good to Africa it's not also good to the global trading and therefore the economy of the globe uh, so Africa has to pull up its socks we have to see to it that we add more value to our products before they're exported so that at least we reduce that imbalance. And the globe, I think, has a role to assist Africa to, to achieve that. 
And what Africa is doing now is to increase intra-trade, regional trading, and also to increase trade between Africa and the emerging economies. A country like India, for example, for its proximity to Tanzania and to Africa, uh, you will find the cultures are also not uh, very different, and therefore trading is partnership, and partnership is, uh, is easy and uh, very convenient for cultures that are not very different. So we look upon the emerging uh, economies to enhance their trade with Africa, but not to continue with commodity trading, but instead of commodity trading, we should really uh, put more emphasis. Ag uh, Africa has comparative advantage on agriculture, and we are faced by food crisis in the globe, and therefore everybody has to look to Africa, but then we also have to see to it is more than farming, Africa has to undertake uh, agro-processing, agribusiness as a way of adding value so that at least that imbalance that exists between Africa and the rest of the world, and I do believe the, econ the emerging economies have a role to support Africa because at the end, both will benefit from the, from the trading. Minister, I want to come back to you about, about the, specifically the, 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 the ways in which the developed world uh, uh, and, and the, the rapidly growing de developing countries like India can specifically help Africa. But on the point of, of agriculture, uh, it's a natural segue to Minister Pacheco. From your standpoint, um, how, how rapidly are the opportunities uh, to trade with India, with China, uh, with rapidly developing Southeast Asia? Do you see it on the ground? Um, uh, what are the, the opportunities and also what are the challenges these days? I thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, let's uh, look uh, to the South South Cooperation, uh, the area where there is no problems. Mm -hmm. We are on the area, on the region, where we have challenges. Uh, number one, we do have a comparative advantage on the natural resource, generally speaking. Uh, if you look to the world crisis today on food shortage, on the water shortage, in the uh, southern uh, hemisphere, we do have a comparative advantage. What we need is to use on a sustainable way to, to move from the aid cooperation to business cooperation, to economic uh, cooperation. Uh, if you look at uh, the locations uh, India to Africa, we share the same ocean. Maybe there was a big earthquake millions and millions ago that split the two. But in fact, uh, the trade between Africa and India or East Asia is already there for many, many and many years. Number two, we are learning to be competitive uh, around the world. Let's use the competitiveness skills we are having as another comparative advantage so we can consolidate, we can improve the business. Uh, the third issue, the South South cooperation, we have to strengthen the, to building the, the, the team as, as one, to come together to, to share our views, to share our resources in a win-win situation so we can overcome our uh, problems, the, the challenge, and we can compete in the international market um, um, as one and to use our comparative advantage. Professor Gupta, to you, how should multinational companies in India look at developing Africa? Strategically, how important can emerging Africa be 
to multinationals in India. And part of a, a slightly broader issue, so I just look at the broader issue and then come to the role of multinationals, which is that uh, in terms of South-South trade, uh, you know, that story is very clear. Uh, you know, to add to Mr. Mutharaman's uh, data, that uh, South-South trade or emerging to emerging trade in 2000 was about 14% of world trade. And today or last year was about 25% of world trade. I'm pretty confident that in another 15 years, actually, that will be more than half of world trade. So I think the numbers of, are there and the trend line is there. But I think structurally, if you look at the nature of the South-South trade, it differs quite significantly from the nature of, say, developed to developed country trade, which is that the South-South trade is largely either raw materials or finished goods, whereas developed to developed trade is much more in intermediates. So you have much more integrated supply chains, integrated value chains, right. and that's where the role of the multinationals. And so I think that what needs to happen, in my view, uh, in terms of South-South trade, is that not just looking at trade, but also actually looking at investment, you know, right. because right. the linkages between India and Africa are not just trade linkages, they're also linkages in terms of investment, <coughs> and the investment linkages right now are much weaker than trade linkages. Right. And I think that's where the role of the multinationals, particularly, right. and Indian multinationals, right. which are phenomenally capable at running distributed global enterprises, yes. uh, including in Africa, yes. I think is going to be huge. Uh, Anup, Anup Singh, um, from the IMF's perspective, you, you said that um, earlier, uh, as we were talking before the panel, that you, you think there are lessons um, to be learned in India from the China experience, um, and particularly the, the demographic transitions that the two countries are now, are now undertaking. Why don't you uh, uh, address that? Okay, Bill, thanks very much. I think this is an important point. The previous speakers have spoken about the importance of uh, trade for growth. And I think this is particularly important now for India and for virtually all the other countries in South-South. India is going through a demographic transition. It is incredible. It has started years ago, but if you look ahead to the next 30 years, not just India, but in other countries in South South too. But in India, one quarter of the increase globally of working population will be in India. One quarter. quarter. Wow. And this is a demographic transition that China has gone through. Right. China is tapering off. India is consolidating. So we're going to have people at the working age. We're going to have 300 million more people in the working population in India in the next 30 years. So the reason I bring this up is it's good for economists, say, from a factor point of view. We'll have more labor. We've seen in other regions that's not good enough. We need jobs. And what we know from China is China went through this demographic transition. What did China do? It did so many things, but at least one thing it did, it fundamentally increased its trade integration around the world. It boosted export-oriented industries right. that had the jobs. And that's what China did. If you look at research available, it bears out what Minister Sharma had just said. Research points out, looking at India's experience too, that it is trade integration that really gives you the productivity increases you need to create jobs, to create markets. So the point I'm seeing is India is going through a remarkable demographic transition India is going to have a huge number of new people working in the working age population. And the research tells us, and China tells us, that nothing is as important as international trade integration. Yeah. And this applies across South-South. 
Minister Sharma, I want to follow up with you uh, referring to um, a point that Professor Gupta made about um, not the, about how we need not just increased South-South trade, but increased South-South investment, direct investment, to build the supply chains that, that he was talking about. Do you expect that to happen? Is it happening? And as a, as a subset of that question, China, as we all know, has been very aggressive through its state-owned companies investing in Africa. India a bit less so. Do you think we're going to see a shift at all toward increased, outbound Indian investment toward Africa? You see, first of all, uh, let me briefly sum up the trade issue. What other panelists have spoken, the South-South trade is increasing. It's true that the quality may be different from, as Mr. Gupta was saying, from the quality of the developed countries' trade, but it is changing constantly. And among the developed countries, if the trade in the last decade has increased four times, amongst the countries of the South, it has multiplied ten times. Also, when I look at the numbers, for example, India's engagement, we do not have, as it used to be many centuries ago, India being a major trading country of the world, the largest to be precise. Today, our share in merchandise trade is little over 2%, and all put together, uh, services and uh, merchandise trade is close to 4%, little over 4%. That is not adequate because we are 1.2 billion people. But of the trade that we have, 600 billion dollars we crossed last year, two-way trade, more than 50 percent, 315 or 320 billion, is India's trade only with the developing countries, and it is increasing. So there's a major shift that is taking place, not that we are not engaged uh, with the traditional markets or the destinations, particularly the developed countries. The second issue is about the quality and how value chains are created. Africa, Asia and South America are getting more and more integrated uh, with the global value chains. Another important aspect which has been underscored repeatedly, as Mr. Anup Singh also said, is about the population. And that is in Africa too. The large number of young people same here, for that matter, in Asia. This is where the future is. Third, uh, the resources. I do not uh, say that uh, we are not uh, clearly following what are the trends in Africa, but we work with Africa very closely. As Minister Mari Nagu had said, she was absolutely correct that we understand each other. We are not strangers in history. We have had shared similar challenges. We have also the same past of missed opportunities when our countries were left behind after the harnessing of the steam power, which transformed Great Britain, and then the Industrial Revolution and all the technologies which came. Today, we have straddled that divide. The new wave of technologies which came, we moved fast enough to acquire global leadership positions. Now, consumption production patterns are different. In China, it is different. In India, it's different. In Africa, it's different. But Africa also is moving very fast towards regional economic integration. Whether, when you look at the wrecks in Africa, whether East Asia community, whether SACU, uh, whether ECOWAS, and uh, we work, therefore, in understanding with them. It's true that China and India do not have, we have resources, but we do not have the same resources or all the resources that we need for our development, particularly when it comes to energy security or some of the precious metals and minerals, where Africa and South America, they have abundance of those resources. But what India is doing is sort of, I do not want to use the word aggressive. 
It's intense engagement. Because what our philosophy is, to be truly a friend and partner in Africa's progress. So over decades, when India did not have enough resources to address the monumental developmental challenges in our own country, to invest in education, to invest in economy, we did share our resources, our experience, with our brothers and sisters in Africa. Tens of thousands of African students have come from the 60s onwards on Indian scholarships to join our professional institutions, to go back as teachers, as doctors, as engineers. Now, that has increased. 2008, we had the first India-Africa Partnership Summit in New Delhi, and the second one was in Addis Ababa uh, this May. Now, we have a focus on capacity building in Africa. Our companies, both the pu public sector and the private sector, are very much conscious of the ethics to create jobs there, to empower people by training them. And this capacity building embraces all sectors, from agriculture to education to manufacturing. Now, investments are also taking place. Indian investments in Africa, when I look at it, the figures are very difficult sometimes to get because the corporates have multinational character today. Many of the Indian companies, they have their investing arms in different countries or locations but also what directly goes from India. Uh, in Africa, it could be anywhere between 35 and 40 billion in recent years, the Indian investments have gone in. And I know for a fact that many of the proposals are in the pipeline. So you will see that this investment is growing. And that is also, in the long run, will ensure that the quality of trade changes, because Africa will be able to provide gainful employment to its younger people. And what is manufactured out, but value addition is already taking place. It's not only the raw material. Sometimes, of course, it's a two-way process, what a country has and what, what a country needs. Uh, because India also uh, is exporting what we have. Another important area, as I conclude, is about the food security. Energy I did refer to. because. Uh, that is a challenge which has resurfaced again with the very high global prices, both commodity and food, uh, the same level as 2008, and the food inventories are very low. So agriculture, again, Africa is very fertile soil, many of the countries have, including Tanzania and Mozambique and other countries, and we are engaged, therefore, in agriculture in a big way in diversification, in irrigation. So it's, it's this engagement. And another enabling thing which India has been doing, and we have now increased that because our own economy has grown and we had more resources uh, than to share with our uh, friends in Africa, that is our lines of credit. So it is $5 billion that was in 2008, another $5 billion in now 2011, which is available for developmental projects uh, to our friends in Africa. So if you look at what is America's engagement with Africa, that's different. What is China's engagement, that's different. What is India's engagement, it has its own character, its philosophy. So I will say it is distinct and different, and it's a relationship which is based on trust, and confidence. I want to come to uh, Minister Pacheco in a minute to follow up uh, on the agriculture point, but first to Mr. Muturaman, just quickly, how would you, wearing your CII hat, how would you characterize your membership's uh, attitudes and, and views toward the possibility of, of outbound direct investment to the South? Are we, are we going to see that? Uh, clearly a, a, a trend already, is it going to intensify? Yeah, well, answering the question, I want to also want to add to what uh, my minister said. Uh -huh. you, you know, there is, as I said earlier, there is going to be even more increased trade between India and the South-South, in between India and the emerging economies. 
Similarly, there is also going to be an increased investments between these, uh, between these economies. One is seeing it already. India has, Indian companies, in my view, have some inherent advantages. One is, unlike what's happening in, with some other countries, we are not going to Africa just to remove the raw materials away and bring it home. We are not going there for that. We are going there to participate in that country's growth. For example, I know of cases where Indian companies have gone to, uh, say, South Africa uh -huh. for a coal mine, but with a promise to establish a power plant there. So there has to be a win-win uh, situation for both the countries. If we go with an approach of uh, you lose and I will win, uh, that relationship is, is not going to last long. And over time, I think Indian companies have established this credibility in, uh, in, in uh, not only in South Africa, in also in a few other countries. So I believe that that investment uh, will actually grow. Secondly, there is a point that was being made about uh, the South-South uh, trade has been entirely on raw materials and not yet on uh, finished products. And my minister made also valuable comments on that. I just want to add, it really does not matter. It really does not matter at the gross level right. as to what you export. But the country should worry about what it is exporting. At a gross level, it, it really doesn't matter. The reason for that is, <clears throat> you know, all countries are not in the same stage of development. If you want to convert, from raw, convert raw material into the next level of product, there is a skill required, there is an investment required, there is a technology required. If you want to convert it and value it even more, you will require even more skills, even more skilled people, even higher research, even higher technology. So there is a natural progression of a country's development and what it exports or what it imports need to fit into that natural progression. Right. Some countries can move on that progression fast. So I'm not particularly against uh, uh, an underdeveloped country or a country which is just on the first one or two legs of that journey to be exporting raw material as long as it realizes quickly that it needs to do something on the fronts of skill and technology and research and so on to get into the next stage of manufacturing. But I can tell you the investments and as well as trade between these South-South countries, between the emerging economies is going to increase several fold and what has happened in the global, uh, as a result of the global economic and financial crisis in the last couple of years right. has, is actually going to accentuate that. Minister Pacheco, to you, I want to follow up on, on the comments specifically about agriculture. The numbers are obvious. We have 1.3 billion people where I live in China. There's 1.2 billion people here in India. Those are a lot of mouths to feed. You have global food shortages. We've had, generally speaking, rising prices. There aren't, more, uh, there aren't many more critical issues globally than increasing agricultural productivity. Is that happening in Mozambique and to what extent are foreign multinational agribusinesses, not just from India but from the United States and Europe as well, how active are they in investing in your company, in your country um, and trying to drive up agricultural productivity levels? Um, look for the, um, the agriculture. Um, if you look to Africa, uh, we have uh, arable land. We are not using enough. We are using around 30% in average. In the case of Mozambique, we are using 10% of our arable land. And that 30% uh, around Africa and 10% of Mozambique, uh, the productivity is very low on the land we are using. So there is a room to increase the productivity. Uh, plus, there is a big room to use the remaining arable uh, land available uh, uh, in, in Africa. In the case of Mozambique, we, uh, we are promoting and attracting investment on uh, agribusiness to increase productivity on the research, research side, to do more research, 
to adopt results that is already reached in the country like India, Brazil, even China, uh, due to the similarity of some agricultural conditions, some technology can be adapted there. I see company moving to oh, Mozambique to investing, and our goal is number one, productivity, and research play very key roles. We have to educate more our research uh, uh, scientists. Uh, Sometimes, if you go to research stations, they have solution for any agricultural problem you have. Yeah. Yeah. They will show you, they will make a fair, but how this technology can be transferred to the farmers. So the extension work, uh, the extension service should be in place to make sure that the technology generated by research is going to be uh, uh, accessible to the, to the farmers. And the, the multinational company on seed side, on agrochemical, they, uh, they can play uh, uh, a very important role. Uh, we are having experience uh, uh, the tri 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 uh, tri trilateral cooperation, Mozambique, Brazil, and China. If you look, uh, and Mozambique, Brazil, and Japan, I'm sorry. If you look to the location of Brazil, if you look to the development that uh, is taking place in Brazil, 30 years ago, Brazil was facing shortage of food. But now, the job done by Embrapa, uh, Brazil now is uh, one of the most playing a key role on the world food basket. We are working uh, with, with Embrapa. The Embrapa, where they just opened an office uh, representation in, in Maputo. I was talking with the uh, uh, Honorable Minister of Tanzania. How can we? Uh, and Brapa bring him up, being in Mozambique, we can work together. This is the kind of operation we can make to boost productivity uh, on the land we are using and to use the remaining uh, 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 arable land that is not yet used in Africa. Water is there. You know, you've, you have a situation that uh, one month, today the people claim about floods. In 10, 15 days they will claim about drought, but the river is crossing, is passing by. How to use uh, properly the water resource we are having to boost uh, agriculture? This is one area that uh, we can explore. We know uh, that India have got uh, quite a large experience on uh, um, management of, uh, of water for agriculture, for industry. And these is, uh, are the rooms that we should take and come together as one to use uh, the potential in a sustainable way. I do believe if we do that, um, we have to start today. Yes. In fact, we should start, we should have started yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are already late. Better late than never. If we don't start immediately, we will end up on facing food shortage. And Minister Nagu, that follows on from, from a point you made earlier that I wanted to come back to you on. What are the other ways in which, in which um, the, the rapidly, uh, develop, rapidly growing countries in the developing world, and for that matter the West, can help uh, Africa? That's a very specific um, very interesting example, the utilization of, of water resources in order to drive agricultural productivity levels higher. What are other examples that, that, that come to mind from where you sit? Well, of course, uh, the potential of Africa and that of Tanzania lies in agriculture, and therefore we place a lot of importance in agriculture. In that industry, right. First, Africa itself is faced with food crisis. We need to have food security in Africa. We need to have food security in the world. And Africa is a big potential. And you cannot separate the importance of investment from uh, trade or from industry. Okay. And therefore, where the South-South cooperation 
can be enhanced in Africa is in investment. Okay. And Africa is trying its best to attract investments not only from the developed countries but from the emerging countries which happen to be within the South South Cooperation. Yeah. I was talking about value addition, I was talking about agribusiness, and this is where the investment is required. But Africa also has potential in many other areas, like we have um, natural resources in the form of coal, iron, and many other metals. And we need investment in that area. We are trying to reduce cost of doing business in Africa. We are trying to create our own middle class because the de effective demand has to start with Africa. We have more or less the same population with India and China. The only difference is the lack of effective demand, the lack of entrepreneurship. And if investment do come to Africa, the Africans will tend to learn from the South-South cooperation in order to enhance trade, in order to increase the share of trade for Africa in the global trading, investment is very important in adding value in the exploitation of the resources, which happen to be many, yeah. but the ability of Africa to exploit those resources are not, uh, is not there. The only thing that Africa is looking for is the win-win situation. Africa cannot continue trading while it is losing. It has to gain from the trade. And if the global uh, economy is growing, that of Africa has to grow as well. And the tendency is there. Most of the African countries' economies are growing. And if the South-South cooperation is enhanced and the developed world is also brought into Africa, right. the issue of global food crisis the issue of energy crisis will be kind of limited because Africa has yeah. that potential. Yeah. The only thing is Africa would not like to lose again within the global trading. Right. Right. No, those are all very fair points. I knew I've, I've noticed you scribbling notes. Uh, would you, why don't you get in here? Well, Bill, um, I think as we've heard from the speakers, um, trade is uh, growing south south there's a lot of scope for it to happen uh, but maybe i should just make one rather obvious point here where india is india is obviously in south asia and as the minister just said india's trade across regions has grown if you look at india's trade with emerging markets and i guess south south is a major component of that this has doubled in the last 15 years but if you look at India's trade in South Asia, uh -huh. it has not increased in the past 15 years. Now, maybe it can be measured in some other way, a third country trade. But what I want to point out is some of the research I recently read on the way here, they were trying to look at India and saying where is the greatest potential for India's trade to develop in the next 20 years. And it's not surprising, but the research tells us that the greatest potential to quadruple in the next one or two decades is within South Asia. There are many ways to see this. If you look at uh, India's share of GDP in South Asia, it's huge, it's 80%. Right. You look where South Africa is in Southern Africa, it's as big. You look at how much trade in Southern Africa is with South Africa, it's huge. If you look at the percentage of GDP that is South Asian trade, it's 10%. And this is not a political point. From all economic criteria, the growth spillovers, benefits to India and others of rising trade are undisputed. So I would say the greatest potential we face is to raise trade in South Asia. And I will make a final point, Bill. We're talking about trade. It's not only trade. In most regions, the Ajmas financial, remittances, services, knowledge. So trade integration is just one aspect of total integration. But surely the, 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 the primary factor limiting South Asian 
Asian trade is political. No? It's geopolitical. I would say equally, from my point of view, equally important are the economic benefits. These are undisputed. And we should focus on the economic benefits, because that is what I think is most important. Minister, you want to? You know, the point which uh, Mr. Rup Singh has made is very valid. Much is happening in our region. It's not that the trade has not increased, but it is well, well below the potential in South Asia. We have taken a number of steps, India being a large economy, in the SARC framework and the SAFTA, that's the trade agreement of the South Asian countries. Afghanistan has joined SARC, so Afghanistan is now part of the SAFTA process. Where India has adopted an approach of asymmetry and reducing tariffs to a large extent, so giving access to Bangladesh, to Nepal, to Pakistan. And there is a forward movement, uh, which is a very welcome development between India and Pakistan. The trade within the region, India's own trade, is close to 17 billion. But South Asia slowly is moving towards a realization of the benefits of economic growth and trade. Because that alone will bring about stability. When the younger people find gains of trade as well as economic development, India is also very clear that we, as we are integral to the uh, process of Asian economic integration as member of the East Asia Summit, that ASEAN plus six process, uh, India is very much there. But South Asia also has to move towards integration and eventually be, as a region, part of this emerging picture of Asian economic integration, which has taken place elsewhere in the world when we look at North America through NAFTA, South America's, the Mercosur and the Andean in Africa. Therefore, the steps that we have in mind will help us to achieve that objective. We are also very clear that India does not want to race ahead on its own, but take in a brotherly embrace the entire region for economic growth and shared prosperity. So hopefully, a few years down the line, when we discuss this subject, it will be a different picture. I remain optimistic about it. There has been historical reasons for why it didn't happen earlier. The pains of partition, the violence, the bloodshed that followed. And the issue was also of trust. And many of the countries of South Asia have been going through different kinds of upheavals. You know, Sri Lanka, until very recently, was violently destabilized. You know, the challenges in Pakistan, uh, which have been there, or the challenges which Bangladesh has faced, or the turbulence in Nepal. Hopefully, things are settling down. And even in Nepal, there's very positive developments recently. And I'm looking forward now uh, to the next SAFTA ministerial, which Pakistan will be hosting. We hosted the Pakistani Commerce Minister and the delegation. I was told that that was the first visit, unfortunately, but happily so. Uh, it took more than three decades for that visit to take place. And they came with a big business delegation, and there was discernible enthusiasm in the business leaders of both the countries. And I saw the same when we went to Bangladesh. So the, my only message is that this region shall also change for the better. Uh, that's a, a, a spot on point that, that you made, Anup. Um, I want to, uh, is, is, this, is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Um, I want to step back and, and broaden the, uh, the, the lens a little bit, um, since one of the points that, that we are to address on this panel is the extent to which the South-South trade and economic relationship 
um, can continue to build in the midst of what is globally a very parlous moment. Now, I tend to be, unfortunately, a born pessimist. Some people are born optimists, some people are born pessimists. I'm in the latter camp. I think Europe is a disaster. I don't think the Euro or the Eurozone can survive in its current form. I think what we see is what we get in the U.S. in terms of growth for the foreseeable future. If Europe falls into outright recession and the Eurozone doesn't survive in its current form, and the United States continues to just plot along at zero to two percent growth, what are the implications for the developing world, both South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Africa? How badly will they be hit under a close to a worst case scenario? I'll throw that to my friend from the IMF. All right, thanks a lot. This is also a very crucial point. Just before I start, I'll be brief. In the last three years, the global crisis hit us. Trade among emerging markets continued to increase. It didn't fall. But now let's look ahead the next five or ten years beyond what happens next week or next month. Mm -hmm. I would say whatever happens, it is quite clear that emerging markets, developing countries, South-South, we are not going to be able to rely on external demand okay. from the U.S. and Europe, as you said. Right. That is a reality okay. which we have to recognize. But emerging markets, India, China, many in South-South, Brazil, are leading the global economy right now. So we have to understand the next five or ten years, it is trade and growth among emerging markets, among developing countries within South-South, that is going to be crucial not only for keeping the momentum of growth high in our countries, but also in the global economy. And therefore, all this crisis tells us is the time has come to rebalance ourselves, to focus our efforts, our investment, and our targets of markets in other emerging markets, and look a little bit beyond relying just on Europe and the U.S. for markets. Oh, fair point. Let me go to, the, uh, uh, to our audience and see if we have any, any questions for any of the panelists um, from, from the audience. Okay, th uh, here we go. There's one right here. I would like to highlight what you just said about uh, things going on in Europe and uh, the EU zone falling apart, as well as uh, the American economy being very stagnant over the next decade. Uh, I would like to put this question to Mr. Singh, uh, that uh, not an economist, but I think uh, the major problem behind all this is the minimum wage rates, which is making uh, the Western economies are uh, very uncompetitive. So should not there be consideration regarding reducing minimum wages in the Western countries? I think, we hear that very well. okay. I think the, uh, the question is, as I understand it, should, uh, should the Western countries, the U.S. and Europe, lower minimum wages lower minimum wages in order to become more competitive. Ah. All right. Well, you're looking at a very important point. As we look beyond the current crisis that is taking place in financial markets, debt markets, and sovereign risk, the most important factor for the advanced economy is to improve the growth outlook. That means structural reforms which include better debt sustainability and a lot of the discussion that is now taking place in Europe is how do you establish the structural reforms that re-establish a growth outlook that is positive. It's not just wages. The broader structural reforms that are being discussed, they will be needed because both for the sake of Europe 
and for the sake of emerging markets, we all need Europe coming back to a positive growth outlook. We need it. B, you want to get in here? Yeah, I, I had a comment on that. Uh, you know, uh, the problems of Europe, I, I'm not an economist or I'm not a finance guy, but uh, looking at it from a businessman's point of view, the problems of the Eurozone or the problems of the US cannot be solved by financial restructuring alone, which is what is uh, just now being attempted. There are far more fundamental structural reform that is required. And one of the most fundamental reform is, you know, look, the problems are because of human behavior. They may look like financial problems or economic problems, but they are behavioral problems. Behavioral problems in terms of consumption and behavioral problems in terms of savings. These are two behavioral problems. Any country which is going to continuously consume more and more and more compared to the wealth it creates cannot be a sustainable thing, whatever financial restructuring that you may do. So I do believe that, <clears throat> that over time, both Europe and U the United States to a lesser extent actually has to change the consumption behavior. And then, because there is no easy solution to my mind for the current problem. And when that's, and that's a very painful thing. And whoever attempts to sort of implement it is going to get sacked. So you'll, you'll find a lot, of, a lot of things are going to happen in those countries where you may have one-term prime ministers and one-term presidents and he will try and she, she or he will try to implement something and he will become unpopular. I, I, see, I see a journey of that nature. Uh, Professor Gupta. The, I, I think in terms of on the wage rates in the U.S., you know, for a, particularly if I look at the U.S., uh, the, uh, reducing the minimum wage, uh, I think it's politically impossible uh, because in any case over the last 20 years, the divide between the rich and poor has increased. And right. so you have the Occupy Wall Street movement. So, so, so reducing the minimum wages is, is out. Now, that said, I'm actually uh, more optimistic about the U.S. economy uh, than many other people. Hmm. Because when I look at, for instance, the trade picture for the U.S., right. of course, it's been running a huge trade deficit. And, the, you know, one can look at it, is it a problem on the export side or problem on the import side? And, of course, you know, U.S. is a big oil importer. Right. And so that's a big contribution. Now, if you look at some of the latest analysis on the oil situation, you know, Daniel Jurgen, uh, you know, is kind of the world's number one expert. And, you know, his recent writings are that essentially over the next 20 years, yeah. uh, the, the shale gas, for instance, uh, the, and, and so the picture will change dramatically, and the U.S. will become far more U.S. dependent on, on, on oil uh, and gas than uh, dependent on foreign sources. And so if that were to play out, it will have huge positive impact in terms of the trade picture for the U.S. Right, right. Other questions? Right here, gentleman in the center, right here. Etienne Defarge, Recruit of Health. Uh, so the, the picture described by a number of the panelists, uh, Mr. Mr. Rahman and Mr. Gupta, um, why can we not just simply assume that uh, with Europe, the U.S. deleveraging, consuming less, um, you know, there would be a new equilibrium by which the BRICS plus Africa that's more than half the world's population, with enormous pent-up demand, uh, are just going to you know, increase the trade. And therefore, the fact that uh, a country like India or China might trade less with Europe and the U.S. will not really be a problem. be more than compensated by the, south, the increase in South-South trade. It's not very clear. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat or re 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 rephrase yeah. the, so the, the point the of the question? The question is, why worry so much about a decrease uh, in consumption in Europe and the U.S., oh, which is going to happen anyway, because the solution is in vastly increased South-South trade. Well, and indeed, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Minister. You conclude first. Yeah. Well, I, w I was just going to say that I, from where I sit, I, I sit in, in, in China, and indeed... Um, the fact is, even though growth is slowing in China, um, the, the, uh, 
the, the pace of consumption or consumption share of the GDP, albeit from a low level, is increasing, and it's increasing very rapidly. Similarly, the, the, the trade surplus is, despite all the, all the stuff we hear about, about uh, China bashers in, in, in Washington and the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, obsessing about the, the current account uh, deficit from the U.S. standpoint, it's down to 2% of GDP in China. The surplus is coming down, and consumption is increasing. So I think, I think he makes a very valid point. Let me just make a very quick uh, comment on that. I think it is a reality. If you go back to the last 20 years of China's growth, it has come from investment, infrastructure, and other sectors. China has a new five-year plan. They also have five-year plans. They have a 12th five-year plan. And the 12th five-year plan has one principle objective, raise consumption. Right. As Bill said, consumption ratio has begun to increase, but you look back 10 or 15 years, the ratio of consumption to GDP in China has fallen. Right. Now, as you look at the next 10, 20 years, it has to increase. This is part of the rebalancing that is taking place from relying on external demand from the US and Europe to consumption in China. Minister. Just to add, there is uh, a pattern of growing consumption in the emerging countries and the developing countries. Uh, it's true that because of the challenges that US and Eurozone is facing, uh, there is going to be some stagnation and fall in consumption. But the fact is that in Asia, the total consumption until recently was just $7 trillion, whereas the US alone the much less population with $10 trillion of consumption. Now, in the next decade, if U.S. will move to 15, Asia will move from $7 trillion to minimum $20 trillion of consumption. And when we look at this country in India, in fact, our economic growth is driven by domestic consumption and domestic production. So there's a different pattern. And I entirely agree with what uh, both... Uh, you have said and Anup Singh that uh, China now has, even in the meetings which we have, conveyed with clarity that their emphasis will be on raising the level of domestic consumption. And the same is happening when we look at Africa uh, with the economic growth, uh, the domestic consumption is growing. So it is, it is in the context of the South-South, it is very relevant. But in the, to sum it up, when we look at the global picture, 7 billion is the world's population. Where do 85% people live? So they have to consume. If their share of the global consumption is not even one third, then this is a sad commentary, and which, that is what has to change and which is changing. Well, if I wouldn't like to say much, but I wish to say a little about uh, the consumption level. It used to be in the past, populations were liability, but currently, or in the present uh, situation, population has turned to be an asset, especially when it has the purchasing power. If you look at the globe, India, China has more population than Europe and the United States. And since their, their progress is based on domestic demand, and in the past, I'm sure, Europe and the, the United States were also finding potential in the, in the population within the emerging economies. Now they are competing, and if the productivities are not similar, then, of course, the emerging world would be taking much of the effective demand, and especially when it is from within their own countries. And the model that has made the United States and the Europe become uh, progress, I mean, brought progress, is not similar to the model that has brought progress to these emerging economies. So I see that there is a lot to learn from each side. We need to learn from Europe and the States, and we need to learn from the emerging economies, and especially when the reasons that brought about higher productivity 
and higher success when it comes to economic growth within the emerging economies is different from the, those uh, which has brought progress to the United States and America. And we have alternative. Now we have more, we have more scope from where we can learn. And hence the reason why we should increase cooperation within the South-South. And with that, of course, uh, the global economic uh, pr uh, prosperity will have to increase. Professor Gupta. Also, I mean, I think in the short term, Europe matters because, you know, the, the banking system in Europe and the U.S. is highly interlinked. So if there is implosion in Europe, it's going to severely affect the U.S. And if you look at U.S.-Europe combined, they are 50 percent of the world's GDP right now. And so therefore, that's hugely important for everybody in the world. But if you look ahead 10 years from now, I think the picture will look very different because 10 to 15 years from now, Asia's GDP will be equal to U.S. and Europe combined. And so at that point, what happens in Europe will be, relatively speaking, more a regional challenge rather than a global challenge. Okay, we are uh, sadly right at the end, uh, out of time here. And I must say, as, as someone who is a born pessimist, I'm somewhat assuaged by what I've heard uh, on the panel uh, this afternoon. Um, despite the, the, the near-term tur near -term turbulence that we're going to see in the, in the developed countries, um, the prospects for South-South trade and continued economic integration um, uh, are not only positive, but, but frankly, it's, it's almost inevitable. Um, just as Professor Gupta said, the world 10 years from now is going to look very different than it does now. And fingers crossed, it's going to look better, not worse. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>